Um, greetings. Um, for those who are in India, good evening. Um, location, Gansham, are we um, broadcasting? Are all of the technical details uh, working well? Uh, shall I proceed? Okay. Um, Jai Shri Kedar. Um, I want to begin my talk by um, remembering that we are just past the seventh year, um, um, seven years since the floods of 2013. Um, and to remember uh, people who were caught in the floods in that time um, uh, and are no longer with us. And also uh, others who have been caught in similar events um, that perhaps did not re receive the same level of uh, publicity um, as the 2013 floods, but are still part of um, life in the mountains. Okay. Um, I want to also start by thanking uh, Lokesh Ohri for the, this invitation and for Gunsham Rai for his technical support and getting me uh, going with Facebook Live. Um, I wanna start by talking just a bit about how I came to be interested in learning about Kedarnat and writing about Kedarnat. Um, I had a, a rather curious way of coming into the subject. I was already very interested um, as, a, as a master's student um, in a graduate program in the United States in pilgrimage and place in Hinduism. I was very interested in the connections between how people experience places that are sacred and the stories that are told. I was interested in the sort of, you know, one reads about um, famous stories from the Puranas or, or the fame, you know, rituals that are done in particular pilgrimage places. And I always was wondering uh, about how these things felt actually. Um, what was the hakikat, uh, the reality of these things? And so, I stumbled on a particular way of investigating it. Um, I got interested in uh, the poster art, the pictures that Yatris would purchase at different Hindu pilgrimage places. And so the first time I came to India was to do, it was a Fulbright funded project. It was to do research on um, just the pictures that Yatris purchase in the market um, when they are getting ready to leave uh, a pilgrimage place after their visit. Um, so the first time I came to India, I spent two months in Masuri um, studying Hindi. Um, then I went for the first time to um, Kedarnath and Badrinath. Um, then I spent about um, five months traveling around India, going to different uh, pilgrimage places, um, uh, north and south, also traveling to some of the printing presses that made the pictures that I was studying. Um, and as I did this, I came to be especially interested in images of Jyotirlingas. I, I, my, my eye kept on being drawn back to pictures of Jyotirlingas. There seemed to be something especially complicated about the way that the deities connection to the place was being represented in Jyotirlinga images. Uh, and so I kind of got especially interested in Jyotirlinga images. I spent a couple of months living in uh, Varanasi. Um, and then at the end of that first trip, I went back up to, uh, uh, I, I went, I went um, back to, uh, back up into the Himalayas. And I remember at the end of that trip, I actually had a dream. I was thinking about poster art so much um, that I had a dream in which I had, um, there were uh, posters of the Chardham um, were floating in my mind. Um, so I first went to Kedarnath in 1999 as a result of this interest in um, pilgrimage art. Um, and then 
Um, as my interest in the Jyoti Lingas grew, um, I gradually, over the course of my time as a graduate student, I kind of ended up focusing, moving from being interested in the um, Jyoti Lingas generally to being interested in Kedarnath uh, specifically. And so I went to uh, Kedarnath in 2000 and 2005, then for my PhD field work, um, uh, spent a lot of the season there in 2007 and a bit of 2008, went again in 2010, went a year um, after the um, after the floods in 2014. Um, and my perspective on how to understand Kedarnath was was developing all this time. Um, and I became very interested in the idea of how uh, a pilgrimage place um, has Shakti, the idea that the idea of kind of understanding places as um, things that can exercise Shakti, that can pull people to them. I was very interested in thinking about the notion of, uh, you know, sort of magnetic attraction or Akarshan. I, I played around a lot with the idea that Kedarnath has a kind of special uh, Akarshan that pulls people to it. Um, as I, I also, um, as I sort of did this research, I investigated from a number of different directions. I looked into, in addition to all these visits, I went and I read stories about uh, Kedarnath in Puranic literature. There's actually a specific um, uh, text called the Kedarkanda Purana um, that is all about um, Garhwal region. Um, I read that uh, and the, the some of the stories in this text about uh, Kedarnath are quite fascinating because they, they they display something that in Puranic literature is called the phenomenon of um, Sarupata, um, which means that when um, a living being, a human or an animal, comes close to a pilgrimage place that the human being or animal assumes the transforms into a form of the deity. And so in the Kedarkanda Purana, there are stories about humans and animals that when they get close to Kedarnath, they turn into a form of Shiva or a form of um, Nandi um, or a form of part of Shiva. Um, and so I, um, got very interested just in this, um, the question of just exactly what is it like for people in their experience, uh, to stand in a pilgrimage place like Kedarnath? What is that like? What is the bhav? What is the anubhav? How do the kind of more daily and mundane aspects of, um, being in a pilgrimage place, either as a yatri or as a porohit or as a, a laborer or as a shopkeeper, how do these things all kind of come together? Uh, and that is what I ended up studying. I ended up studying how many, many different aspects or elements um, of experience combine uh, in a place like Kedarnath to produce a kind of a single holistic experience. Uh, that's what I wrote about in my dissertation, and that's what I was kind of starting to write about um, in a book form when uh, the floods came in 2013, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, the, the, there are some famous stories about Kedar, not well known, probably to many people who are, who are tuning in. Um, one is the story that the Pandavas um, at the end of the Mahabharata um, uh, head into the Himalayas to seek purification um, um, for themselves um, from, the, from their actions, the Mahabharata war. As they enter the Himalayas in, in the versions of this story that are um, specific to Kedarnath, um, they are seeking uh, darshan of Shiva uh, to gain that purification and Shiva sort of continuously um, eludes them. He's always kind of goes away from them. They pursue him up into the mountains and they finally catch up to him. Um, and actually in some versions of the story, touch him or grab him to keep him in, in to keep him from moving away um, in the place that's now Kedarnath. Um, 
That's one of the most famous stories about Kedarnat. There's another set of stories about Kedarnat that have to do with the tapasya of um, Nara Narayan, um, and that have to do with the identity of Kedarnat as a, a Jyotirlinga, uh, one of the one of the twelve lingas of Shiva that are uh, made of light. Um, those aspects of this, those stories about Kedarnat connected. Uh, both um, um, both to the sort of the broader complex of the 12 Jyotirlingas, the Dvadash Jyotirlinga, and also to um, Pashupatinath in Nepal. Um, but when one kind of combines all of these stories, uh, there is a very special feeling that comes. Um, there is a special feeling that somehow, on the one hand, you're in a place and the story is kind of telling you about a place where God is especially present, is especially powerful, that all you have to do is make the effort to get to this place. Um, and you can have an especially um, intimate encounter with God. At the same time, there's a sense in these stories that God is always receding and trying to go away. Um, Shiva, at the moment that the Pandavas catch up to him, actually is trying to, in some versions of the story, um, dive into the ground uh, and, and to escape further. Um, the, um, in the versions of the um, mountain going, um, the mountain going of the Pandavas into the Himalayas, the Svargarohan stories, the ones that are specific to Kedarnat usually tell that this, um, you know, after after this time in Kedarnath, ultimately the Pandavas continue walking up into the Himalayas and eventually out of their lives. Um, uh, and so there's also a sense that, um, that you see in the stories that something is pulling you that you're always trying to catch, um, that, that you always have to go further um, to to touch God, that you always have to go further up into the mountains, which as some people experience this, I know I have, when you walk in the Himalayas, sometimes all you want to do is just to keep going, um, that feeling. So I looked at these stories as kind of guides. Um, and the more I looked, I looked into sort of the history of uh, the different stories that people tell about Kedar not. Um, I also got very interested. I also ended up getting quite interested in the pictures that people take of it, the people purchase of Kedarnath. Um, that ex and and actually, I have a couple of them here. I can show uh, some of the earliest images that got me really interested in Kedarnath. Here is one. Um, here is another. Um, Here is a third. What I noticed was quite common in Jyotirling images and especially Kedarnath images was basically that in most of the images, the relationship of the, of the deity to the place is never depicted in only one way. In most of the images, the relationship of the deity to the place is usually depicted in multiple ways. And my thought was that part of that reason is that simply the sacred power of the place and the relationship of the God to the place is so complex that it can only be represented through multiple perspectives. Um, that was something that I learned from analyzing the, um, these kinds of photos and then I kept in mind. Um, and then as I did my research, as I studied the history of uh, Hindu pilgrimage, as I spent time in Kedarnath, um, I gradually came to think about Kedarnath specifically and also kind of um, pilgrimage places more generally as places that do several things. They're places that gather, they, they take a number of different elements, stories, beliefs, experiences, ideas, money, they gather all these things together and fuse them into a single experience. They gather people from, in the Kedarnath case, all Kedarnath's case, all over the country and all over the world. Um, that they sort of they gather things together and transform those into experiences. 
Um, the other thing that became quite clear to me the more I learned about Kedarnath is that places like Kedarnath function as places of intersection between different ways of um, different forms of, um, of bhakti, um, different kinds of identity. Uh, famous pilgrimage places like Kedarnath are places of intersection between um, Pahari identity and Pahari worlds. Um, there is a whole local tradition of Garwali pilgrimage to Kedarnath and especially the pilgrimage of Garwali Devtas to Kedarnath. And of course, there are people who are visiting Kedarnath and other, uh, other members of the Uttarakhand uh, Chardham um, from all over the nation and from all over the world. And so it is a place where people from many, many different walks of life are intersecting, people who have many, many different uh, reasons for being in Kedarnath. It could be faith, uh, it could be bhakti, it could be um, a combination of the two, um, it could be um, nature tourism, it could be part of a family vacation, it could be because your livelihood brings you to Kedarnath, it could be because your family has a hereditary um, adhikar. Um, um, namaste Sura Piji. Um, um, there are so many different um, ways that um, um, in a place like Kedarnath, you have different worlds meeting. Um, and so in my work, what I also got very interested in was the ways that so many different things are all mixing and combining in a place like uh, Kedarnath. And so um, as I learned more, I thought about how to be in a place like Kedarnath, to stand there, just to be present in a place like that um, is a combination of so many things, Anubhav, the, the hakikat of pilgrimage tourism, um, the sort of the stories that you would find in a Puranic Mahatmya story, um, the sort of experience of doing something that is a traditional part of your dharma, um, the feeling that one is doing a yatra, which is part of dharma, the experience of being um, on a vacation or a tour, um, the experience of being in a place where Hindus of different, uh, many different backgrounds experience themselves all kind of together. Um, the, the, and there are so many other levels as well. So for example, the way that um, the kind of sacred geographies of Kedarnath um, have become connected to what you might call the sacred geography of the nation state. Um, the way that the and, and of the and of the state of Uttarakhand, right? Kedarnath as a pilgrimage place um, is supported by both the state of Uttarakhand um, and now um, the central Indian government. Um, and then all around, uh, all around the village, all around the place um, are the Himalaya. Um, and there are so many different ways to relate to the Himalaya. Um, as a place to go for self purification, to multi to to sort of purify yourself, um, as a symbol of natural beauty, as the water table for much of um, for much of South Asia, um, as a kind of a um, a symbol of a place that um, has not yet fully been brought into some kinds of um, development agendas. Um, so all of these kinds of things just um, um, come together when you're when you're um, when you're walking or you're riding in a pony or you're going up to going up the path to Kedarnath um, when you're waiting in line to enter the temple temple to take darshan and touch the lingam um, all of these things are kind of combining um, and so one of the big things that I saw as a pattern in Kedarnath 
Um, it was there in the 2000s. Um, I think it was, you can trace it back in a way um, to over a thousand years ago. I think it was there then. Is a way that every bit of the place is connected to every other bit of the place. And every bit of the place is also connected to the God. Um, and so there is just this profound thickness and intensity of um, connection and presence um, um, and weight um, that I think um, is part of being in Kedarnath, uh, in, my, in, in my view. Um, The longest time that I spent in Kedarnath area was during my um, my dissertation field work, which was um, 2007 and 2008. And so that's, you know, it's about five years before the floods. And what I remember from that time is, especially in the first six to eight weeks or so, you know, the high season, um, May and the first part of June, or late April, May, in the first part of June, um, is just how busy Kedarnath was. Things were bursting at the seams in the seams in those years. Um, it felt like just this constantly expanding bubble. Um, it was a, a it was a kind of an environment in which almost any kind of investment in pilgrimage tourism in the Kedarnath Valley made sense. Uh, you know, even if you could get any kind of the smallest shop in Kedarnath or at a good spot in the Kedarnath Valley, a, a shop or a lodge or a hotel, even if you had to borrow a great deal of money, it was it, it felt like a good investment. Um, and there were so many people coming through Kedarnath every day during the high season. It just um, um, it just really felt like this kind of expanding balloon. Um, that's what I remember from the time. Um, and so then when the floods came, um, I remember where I was. I, I was actually sitting in my office in Wisconsin, writing, taking what I had written as a student to my dissertation and starting to turn it into a book. And I remember I started hearing uh, reports about the floods. Um, it was a tragedy on so many different levels. It was a Pahari tragedy, tragedy. it was a national tragedy. Um, I think for a lot of people in, Kedar, in the Kedarnath Valley, um, who lost both who lost family and who survived, there was a sense that there was a kind of, just a puncturing of hope. Um, um, a sense of a sense, just a um, a huge weight, um, and I didn't. I was not able to even come to the Kedarnath Valley until a year later, and I still remember coming a year later, um, and the way that people's faces looked when they remembered um, the Apta. Um, it's very, very difficult. Um, I think it also, I think many people felt like there was a sense that something had gone wrong, um, that maybe things had developed too fast, that maybe some of the people who were coming into the region were not acting in a dharmic way. Um, that maybe some things were not being done in a proper way, which made the losses even worse. Um, I um, I lost many friends at that time. Um, I don't think I can discuss them all. I do want to make sure to mention my my friend and research assistant, um, Bhupendra Singh Pushpawan. Um, I see one of his relatives is here with us. Uh, um, Bhupendra and I, Bhupendra was, um, I 
spent a lot of time with them over a period of many years. Um, and during those periods of, um, during the season of 2007, we spent most of that season living in Kedarnat together in the same room. Um, much of what I learned about Kedarnat and about um, Kedarnat Valley was through Bupendra. Um, either he personally taught me or when we, he would introduce me to people who would speak to me because they knew about his good character. Um, and I, th and I, I um, much of what I learned would not be possible without him. Um, and so I remember when I went in 2014, um, I felt his loss. I felt the loss of hundreds and hundreds of people um, that I knew. Uh, and I don't mean that that is the ultimate number. I mean that as people whom I knew quite personally. Um, and I also remember at that time in 2014 um, being so extremely aware of my privilege uh, because I was able to visit experience that grief and then leave and come back to the United States and come back to Wisconsin. Um, I did not have to stay in the Kedarnath Valley. I did not have to, for the rest of my life, be triggered by those memories and worries every time it rains during monsoon season. Um, um, and so when I was trying to kind of work through all of that and process it, um, I thought a lot about what I could do um, and what I couldn't do. Um, we don't actually need a scholar of uh, religion um, to say in any kind of technical way what went wrong uh, with the Kedar not floods. I think that um, looking back it's just so obvious um, that there were so many things that could have been done could could have been done differently. Um, levels of preparedness. I mean, there were there were so many. Um, it was quite clear that there were things that could have been done before the floods that would have ma made made it so that far fewer people lost their lives and had property pro property destroyed. Um, the tragedy to me is that those things can, were only sort of realized in retrospect. Um, in that sense, one of the things I think is important to say about the floods of 2013 is that it makes sense to think about them as what you would call an unnatural disaster. Um, um, a disaster that had a natural component, um, but that also um, the effects of that disaster were made much worse um, through unsustainable development, lack of re regulation, lack of planning. Um, we also know um, that the kind of event specifically that happened with Kedarnat, a, a glacial lake outburst flood, um, is a phenomenon that has been increasing because of climate change. And so even the part that we would call natural the, you know, the, the intense rain and the floods themselves um, arguably have a human element, an anthropogenic element. Um, and so to understand um, everything about what, what had happened, why was there less warning? How did the situation come about in the way that it did? What I ended up doing was learning a lot about ecology and environmental history um, to supplement what I already knew uh, about Kedarnath. Um, and it, when I did that, what I kind of, what I realized was that many of the forms of kind of um, pilgrimage related infrastructure development that had been, and, and that had been going on were sort of at odds with um, some of the some of the visions of Pahari sustainability that have been part of the founding of the state, and then there was a real mismatch there. That to some degree, the 
explosion of pilgrimage tourism, uh, the number of people who were coming simply was beyond what people who are in mountain tourism would call the, the, the carrying capacity um, of the, the Chardham area. Um, so I studied um, things having to do with the Apta, all of the controversies having to do with um, what were the causes, um, what was the best way to proceed with reconstruction. Um, I studied all of it. Um, and what I, the conclusion that I, that I came to, the theme that I kept on coming back to over and over again was the same theme that I had looked at before, connectedness, the way that everything about Kedar Nant is, is connected to everything else. So for example, you could think about this as the kind of conversation you might have if you were in a chai shop. Um, people would say, well, really, the opta was about climate change. Um, these glacial, glacial lake outburst floods are happening because of climate change. And then someone else would say, no, it was really, yes, it is about climate change, but really it was about unsustainable development. There needed to be more regulation. Um, there needed to be sort of better attention paid to um, being in Kedarnat in a way that was good for everybody and good for the place itself at the same time. Um, there were people who said that, that, that the APTA was partially about human hubris and greed, that people were trying to kind of profit too much in a short-term way. Um, there were people who said that it was about desacralization, um, that one of the things that had changed in the recent explosion of Yatra tourism was that people were not approaching the place um, with proper reverence and with not coming with the proper attitude. Um, some of the, um, a very, very common theme, I think, in the history of um, Garwala and Uttarakhand about Sometimes what is good for Pahari peoples is not the same. The, the needs of Pahari peoples are not the same as those needs of people who are coming from outside of uh, Pahar. Um, that came up. Um, the idea that um, this is about um, divine displeasure, that it comes back to the nature of Shiva and Shakti in her form as Ganga. All of these things would be said in a chai shop conversation, in the, in the newspaper articles that I would read, in the conversations I would have. So what became notable to me was that it was never, all the conversations that I, was, that I participated in about um, the opta ended up being about multiple elements, also climate change, but also divine anger, also unsustainable development, but also climate change. Um, and so what I, what I kind of ended up understanding um, was that in a way it comes back to what I think is a very important and deep theme that runs in, um, it's very a deep theme in Hindu traditions. Um, it's also a very deep theme and people who look at the, info, at the sort of the intersection of religion and ecology and an environmental activism, which is the relationship between inside and outside, uh, the relationship between your inner self and the outer world. Um, and interestingly enough, this is even shown in some of the pictures that um, initially got me interested in Kedarnat. So if you look in this picture, you'll see, this is a photographic montage in which the linga that is inside the temple has been has been montaged into being in front of the in, into being in front of the temple, making inside outside. Um, so that there's really, I think, in terms of processing experiences of Kedarnat, ways that people think and feel about Kedarnat before and after the apta. Um, one of the things that we come to um, is. Uh, the idea that um, things that are happening out in the world 
are also happening inside of us and vice versa. Um, and so I tried to write about Kedarnath in a way that showed those connections. Um, the book that I eventually did write, um, which I want to say um, is available to anybody who's watching as a free ebook. Um, I can get that information to you. Um, it tries to show how we cannot talk about development or ecology um, in a way that is separate from the English term religion. Um, and I thought I wanted to give people who do not themselves study religion a way to kind of think about um, um, think about the ways that religion is a part of uh, is sort of a sort of at the at the level of hakikat part of everything. Um, and so I tried to write the book in that way. Um, I was asked to reflect a little bit on what what I think will be happening with pilgrimage in the future. Um, I guess either in a way that is specific to Kedarnath or in general, um, which is a big question. Um, I'll just say a couple of things and then we can see if you have questions. Um, um, people who study pilgrimage in sacred place notice that on the one hand, sacred places like Kedarnath are places of divine power and divine presence. They involve faith, they involve bhakti, um, they pull on the sort of the deepest heartstrings um, that we have. At the same time, they also function as a microcosm of the world. They involve money, they involve politics. Um, they do now and they always, they always have. Um, um, so we always see that kind of dynamic tension between what you might call the sort of the processes of bhakti and faith and the processes of money and politics. Um, so that will continue, that dynamic tension will continue. Um, I think that we may see a kind of what you might call an ebb and flow of a sense of the sacredness of a particular place. There may be periods when um, Kedarnath is sort of um, regarded as more sacred and treated more as a Tam and as a Tirthstan. And we may see periods when it's treated more as a destination for Yatra tourism. And there may be a kind of an ebb and flow. Um, another thing that many people have written about as a kind of a feature of life in the 20th and 21st centuries is um, a kind of a back and forth flow between what's called territorialization and deterritorialization. On the one hand, um, you know, we're in a globalizing world, we're, we're everywhere. Right? I'm sitting in a, my basement in Wisconsin um, as we do this. Um, so another, in one sense, we have kind of moved beyond location, but the move beyond location produces its opposite. Locations become especially even more important. Um, uh, I think that's, you know, the, um, the focus that um, location is giving to walking, I think is a good example of that. Um, and so I think, um, again, I think you'll see an ebb and flow of that, a kind of on the one hand, um, I think in Hindu traditions, you know, one of the most famous ideas in Hindu traditions is that God is everywhere. Um, you can find God within yourself. It doesn't need to be in a particular location, but at the same time, particular locations become extremely important. Um, and so I think, I think you'll just see a kind of a back and forth pendulum swing between forms of religious experience and bhakti that are focused on places and forms that swing away uh, from particular places. Um, specifically, as far as Kedarnath and Chardham goes, um, I think we again see a kind of a push and a pull, a dynamic tension between different factors. We have the needs of locals. Um, you can see that now with um, the with some of the reorganizations that have uh, uh, that have been happening with um, the management of the Chardham um, and the complaints of um, local peoples relative to that management. 
Um, there's always going to be the needs of um, people in a particular sort of Pahari location are not always are, are, are usually not going to be the same as the needs of visitors to the region. There'll continue to be a dynamic tension between those things. Um, I think that um, both because of things that have to do with the natural world, such as the kind of um, changing state of Himalayan geology, as well as sort of things having to do with public health, such as COVID, there is continually uh, dynamic tension between those factors, factors that are beyond human control in the short term, um, and the enormous economic power of Yatra tourism, um, which is clearly growing. And, and um, it seems, uh, I mean, I was, it's been amazing how Yatra, how Yatra rebounded after the, uh, within several years after the floods of 2013. Um, and the amount of, so the amount of reconstruction um, and especially like the, the particular role played by um, Colonel Kotial and the Narrow Instrument Institute of Mountaineering. Um, the amount of um, devotion and energy uh, focused on places like Kedarnat, I think, will continue, but the forms will the forms will change. But there are all these tensions. The um, the increased organization with which Pahari peoples are trying to control their own destinies ver uh, versus the kind of political economic fact of Yatra tourism. Um, so I think all of these things will continue, um, but there will be these different sort of tensions that push and, uh, that push and pull. Um, I sometimes, there's an idea um, um, mentioned by an anthropologist named Don Handelman, who quotes a theorist named Gregory Bateson that talks about studying religious rituals as if they are um, hydro, a hydrological matter having to do with the flow of water. Um, and the idea that Handelman discusses is the idea that um, somehow um, things find a way forward, just like a river flowing. There's somehow, somehow things will find a way forward. I think that um, the Shakti of a place like Kedarnat um, is going to continue pulling people. Um, and we will see all of these different, um, different factors um, and what that looks like. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish my, my, my formal remarks by re remembering something that Ayatri said to me in the 2007, 2008 time period when I was in Kedarnat. He had been coming to Kedarnath for over 20 years. This is in 2007, and he had seen a number of changes in that in that in those decades. And I said, "Well, do you think that that has changed the nature of Kedarnath?" And he said, "He doesn't think it changed the essential nature of Kedarnath, but he thought that it was becoming wrapped in more layers of Maya." Um, and I think that is as good a place as any to um, uh, to conclude. Jai Shri Kedar. Um, I guess we've got about 15 minutes. If you have questions, you can write them um, in the uh, chat box and I will, I will do my best to answer. Are there questions?
Um, I'll just wait a couple more minutes for uh, um, for any questions that people might have. Oh, I see. I have to scroll. Oh, okay. Sorry. I forgot to scroll. Um, okay. Some, okay. Um, so, uh, Bhavna Bisht asked a question about um, what are my perspective stands Kedarnath apart from others? Um, well, um I do think that to some degree the particular ways that the relationship of the temple to the place and the way that it combines with the geology and travel to that place the combination I think is somewhat distinctive um I, I say that just kind of based on my own experience and also some reports from others that that what you might call the kind of energy of Kedarnath feels a little bit different. Um, um, some, 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 um, I would say some Hindu pilgrimage places. Uh, I think make more of the kind of connections to the natural environment than others. So of course, uh, Amarnath does this. Um, I think um, Jagannath Puri does this with the ocean. Um, that is um, that is one thing. Um, I do think that to some degree, Shaiva places have a particular kind of energy to them, or Shakta places have a particular kind of energy to them. Um, I think there could be a distinctive combination of factors. Um, I hope that answers the question, at least in some part. I see, uh, Vanita, you had this basically the same. You had basically the same, um, the same question. I, yeah, I mean, to me, I think just the way that um, the place and and travel to the place sort of fuses with the experience of going to the temple, um, the way that it all kind of comes together as a single experience. It's like the entire valley um, is like a, a sort of a focusing ring for your experience. To me, that feels distinctive. Um, I can't say that for sure because I have obviously spent most of my time thinking about Kedarnath itself, but that is my kind of considered opinion. Um, Lokesh, you're asking how the new road impact, impact the Yatra. I mean, uh, in general, I, I think that um, the way that inf increased, you know, any kind of infrastructure, what it what it what it does is it it, it will do two things, it will it will make it easier for more for more people to come. Um, which is complicated. Of course, it's a at least a short-term economic good. Longer term, I think is I think we would need some people who are really focused on political economy in the Himalaya to kind of weigh in on that. Um, so it will kind of send more people um, there. Um, it may also, depending on its construction, probably make the experience of yatra and the practice of yatra safer which also changes the experience. I mean, this is something that people have said all the time, which is that it used to be um, um, that going on Yatra into the Himalayas was something that you didn't know that you were going to come back from. And even, even when it was no longer that, there is a sense of, of risk um, that is, I think, part of the process of self-purification self and bhakti. 
Um, um, and so I think any kind of infrastructure developments that make travel, you know, to Kedar, not to the Chardham, safer and easier um, will change that. Um, Lokesh, does that answer the question? There are uh, other questions. Now I understand how I'm supposed to scroll. I can keep scrolling down. I think it'll be I think it'll be quite interesting to see what um, what Yatra to Chardam looks like after June thirtieth of this year. Um, it's a testament to the importance of Yatra that it will proceed at all and that the temple is opened. Um, but again, of course, it raises all the same questions about regulation and short-term versus long-term interests raised by many other developments relating to pilgrimage in the Himalaya. Um, would I have a prescription for people working on, um, working on developing the Yatra? Shouldn't the influx of pilgrimage be controlled? Those roads might be counterproductive. Um, well, I would certainly back off of applying. I would, I would not feel comfortable applying a prescription. I mean, I have not spent significant time in the region for several years at this point. Um, and so just to be clear, I do not have up-to-date data. Um, in a general sense, um, I, I can say a couple of things. One is that um, I think that we should pay as much attention as possible to the experiences and views of local of of of, of local people, um, I think that local knowledge about what works, what's a good idea. I think the autonomy of Pahari peoples. Um, so, from the perspective of developing the yatra, um, my first thought would be to pay more attention to um, what's beneficial for locals um, because I think yatris will come in whatever way you offer them to come. Um, I also think that you know whenever we're talking about things like developing, you know, development, the cost, developing the yatra, roads, I mean so much of development has to do with things like infrastructure. Um, Um, the question has to be sort of, it's, you know, it's, it's always an, it's, it's, it's an, it's an economic question, right? Um, and so I think that, um, specifically speaking about Kedarnath Valley, I think that, um, if more attention is paid to non- Yatra related economic incentives and educational institutions and sustainable development and incentives in the Kedarnath Valley, that will make conversations about Yatra related development easier. Um, as long as um, 
it's very, I mean, it's just, it's very difficult to kind of, you know, so Vanita, what you said about the roads might be counterproductive. It's very difficult to sort through what we mean by productive. Uh, productive for who? Um, productive, how is, is that measured over a time scale of productive over the next five years, over the next 10 years, over the next 50 years? Um, so I think that um, the most, in my view, um, the most productive forms of planning would be the ones that are thinking in the most long-term possible way. Um, but you cannot have long-term conversations when many of the locals involved or most of the locals involved, their lives force them to think about things in a short-term way economically. Um, I don't know. Does that help to answer the question? I mean, I think that generally speaking, unless there is, you know, it's the first year or two after a flood event like 2013, in a general sense, I think yatris will, yatris will come unless it's perceived as dangerous. Um, so the question is more sort of, I think, how to think about it in a long-term way. Um, I can just to kind of illustrate the complexity of, of these things, I, I think back to a particular conversation I had um, at one of the helicopter pads in Kedarnat once. So obviously the, the, heli the, the sort of helicopter yatra um, became increasingly popular um, and there's a whole microeconomy that connects to helicopter yatra, of course, right? Um, which is important, but also overflies many of the other kinds of um, industry that you would have. So if you, so on the one hand, if you are involved with helicopter yatra, if you're a local person, that's a good revenue stream. On the other hand, if someone comes to a place like Kedarnat through a helicopter, then they're not staying in a hotel, they're not having food in the region, things like this. So it's complicated. Um, so I remember talking with a particular family um, who were coming from the South, um, from South India. And um, I was talking with them they, about whether they thought that Yatra by helicopter was kind of appropriate for this kind of a place. Um, and it was a whole family. There was a grandparents and a, husband, wife, and their children, so at least three generations. And what the husband said to me was, this is, if, if we didn't come by helicopter, my mother wouldn't be able to come here. Are you telling me my mother wouldn't be able to come here? Um, and I said, no, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't dream of telling you that. Um, but I think in a way that is the question, right? Um, on the one hand, it is difficult to say about a place like Kedarnat that everyone should not be able to come. On the other hand, there are maybe some good reasons why everyone should not be able to come at a given time. Um, I don't know if that, so maybe that, that was a conversation that I think kind of encapsulated many of the, many of the issues.
Um, okay, thanks, Lokesh. Um, thanks for this invitation. Um, uh, Jai Shri Kedar.